and Humid Houston. I'm so glad you were able to join us. Uh, before we get started with the information, the, um, the webinar that we're going to do today, I did just want to mention a couple of things sort of as a stay tuned. After the webinar, you're going to be getting an email with the agenda for Wednesday, um, the 13th. What we did after, after our last meeting in June, we took all of the comments and the feedback, the expected outcomes, and we analyzed that and looked for trends. And then we decided that this is really a very big issue and we only have a certain number of meetings. So we came up with a plan which will hopeful will result in a solid list of recommendations regarding revisions to the reading initiative for the state board. So for this coming Wednesday, the, which I can't believe is a week from tomorrow, we're really going to focus on the assessment piece of the reading initiative. And then in September, we're going to focus on the professional development. And then in October, we're going to focus on remediation. So before each one of our meetings, we will have a webinar with some background information. There will be information posted to the Google site, which we can look at. And um, that's, that's closed for us, but also Stephanie Lee, who's been so helpful. Thank you, Stephanie. We'll post it on the SDE website. Um, but there will be some, some homework ahead of time. Uh, by the way, this session is going to be recorded, so for our members who weren't able to participate today, they can access it later. And the other thing is Stephanie's going to help me and watch for questions, because I do want to make sure that we have such a wide range of experiences and understanding. I want to make sure that our purpose today is that we kind of come to some understandings in terms of terminology and um, understanding but also I want to make sure that uh, everybody's voice is heard. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Before we get started, if anybody has any questions, would you raise your hand? So, and then we can unmute you and you can uh, ask away because I, I want to make sure that we answer everybody's questions or concerns. So any questions? Okay, I don't see any, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. First of all, a little bit about um, Nye House Education Center, just as background, which is why did I leave beautiful Idaho and move to hot and humid Houston? Um, but Nye House Education Center is a, sort of a think tank for literacy. We've been around for 34 years, and uh, we're nonprofit, private, and we do research regarding uh, literacy. Our background, or the way we were started, was by a group of parents and concerned citizens uh, who felt that at the time there was no place locally for teachers to come and receive information about what were best practices, and this is going back to 1980, regarding working with students with reading disabilities. And uh, 34 years later, uh, our questions have changed, but the mission stays the same, which is our goal is for all children. Um, especially those children who struggle to read at or above grade level. So I'm happy to answer any questions about Nye House. You can shoot me an email, but for now we'll go right into why we're here today, the nature of reading disabilities. Okay, so I'm going to try to move this a little bit. So first of all, the definition of reading. Um, reading is a complex set of skills. The good news is about 60% of children will learn to read relatively easily by being taught with any method. About 40% of children will require direct instruction in the patterns and the rules of the language, and a smaller percentage will require a great deal of instruction. The challenge is identifying those students who need more support early enough to intervene intensively enough to improve their reading ability. Okay. The other thing that's uh, important to know is that reading, unlike speech, is not a natural process. Every culture has a spoken language, but interestingly, only a relatively few have a written language. It's a cultural invention, and one has to be taught how the written language relates to the spoken language in order to learn to read it. A very famous uh, reading researcher, Dr. Marianne Wolf, says, unlike language, reading has no specific genes to set up its circuitry or to dictate its development. 
So from a functional standpoint um, or from a neuroscience standpoint, reading is a relatively new invention in terms of our, at our very basic uh, brain level. Later on in the presentation, I'm going to show you some um, scans of different types of brains to show the difference between a skill reader and how they process and a, a child or an adult who struggles with reading. So let's go down to the very basic. So when we think about it, we see these three letters, C-A-T. And by the way, just learning the alphabet greatly increases children's ability to read, as it makes sense. But we want to think about two different things. When you see those three letters or those three squiggles or whatever, you have to do two processes. First thing that you have to do is look at the first letter C. You translate that to the sound that it would make. Then you look at the next letter, the A, A, and then the final letter T. And you start to get a visual representation. So not only is, are, is it complicated by recognizing the symbol, then attaching a sound to it, blending it all together, that would be the word recognition or the decoding part, but then it's your language comprehension that helps you identify a concept, in this case a cat, for you to attach meaning to it. So decoding is the process of changing the individual letters of a word into sounds. Comprehension is taking the word and adding meaning. Skilled readers have both word recognition, that ability to decode words, and language comprehension. The other thing that's important as we meet, and especially as we talk about assessment and remediation, is to have some understanding of the terminology that relate to reading disabilities. The first term, dyslexia, is not a term that's used frequently in Idaho. Although, interestingly, about 10 states have specific legislation regarding dyslexia. In Texas, where I live, the original legislation was passed in 1985. Dyslexia, for our purposes, is um, a synonym for a reading disability. In Idaho, you hear the term specific learning disability much more frequently, or SLD. Um, dyslexia is a specific learning disability, but there might be others that would uncover uh, students who might have issues with math or um, perhaps dysgraphia, issues with writing. But a specific learning disability is just that, and then it's up to the uh, educators and the families to define what that is. Reading disability kind of covers um, the, the waterfront, but as we'll see in a little bit, a reading disability can be in any number of areas. Phonological awareness is the awareness of the sound structure of words, and it encompasses a variety of uh, skills. For example, the ability to count words in a sentence, to recognize a syllable, and even to recognize individual speech, speech sounds in written words. Uh, those are called phonemes. And then decoding, which you'll hear a lot about, especially in terms of assessment, is that word recognition, the ability to identify the letters, attach sounds to them, and read the word. Um, while uh, I use the terms reading disability and dyslexia and specific learning disability, they're all very similar. Uh, I will say that uh, nationally there is a movement, um, there is a, a group, and one of them is uh, Congressman Bill Cassidy in Louisiana who is encouraging specific legislation uh, regarding the use of the term dyslexia. So often when we hear disability, uh, we think that there are some cognitive issues. Uh, just so we're clear, children or uh, people with reading disabilities have average or above average intelligence, but they have a specific challenge when it comes to reading. Um, and that's why oftentimes they prefer the term dyslexia as opposed to anything that has the word disability in it. So questions about any of those terms? Okay, we're going to move forward. Um, what I wanted to talk a little bit about was this idea that learning to read is a very complex skill. Uh, there's a rope there and there's a reason. There's another researcher, Scarborough, who talks about the many strands of skilled reading. 
it requires not only word recognition, which is the kind of cornerstone of what uh, folks with dyslexia or reading disabilities often are identified for an inability to do uh, word recognition, but it also involves language comprehension. For example, you need both comprehension and word recognition to be a skilled reader. Background knowledge is critically important so that when you're reading something, it has meaning. So often our children in living in poverty lack those first two items, background knowledge, having a contextual understanding about what they're reading, as well as vocabulary. I remember when we were first creating the IRI and Waterford was the vendor, the passages that they sent included the word sidewalk. Uh, and it was very grateful to one of the folks who was on the steering committee who brought uh, to my attention that for many of our children in Idaho, the term sidewalk was something that they would be unfamiliar with because you don't see a lot of sidewalks in some of the places. So background knowledge adds to your ability to read and to comprehend. Vocabulary seems to be the missing piece. We can teach children to decode excuse me, but those early language experiences, that understanding of a wide and rich vocabulary ultimately has the greatest impact on comprehension. Another critical piece is language structures, which would be grammar, understanding the syntactical organization of language, uh, how, how figuring out how the words go together, the function of different words, a noun, a verb, an adverb, understanding it, that all aids to comprehension. Verbal reasoning is the sort of uh, understanding and reasoning using concepts um, in words. For example, things like cause and effect, if this, then that, drawing conclusions, drawing inferences, all of those things are the ability to sort of think critically, and we would call that critical reading or critical thinking. But when we assess it, it's referred to as verbal re reasoning. And then finally, literacy knowledge. For our children living in poverty, we find many of them have not had access to printed materials, and they don't, simply don't understand how books or other printed materials work, the title, the author, the contents, things like glossaries. They haven't had experiences with books, and so something as simple as that we read from left to right, that is something that often has to be taught early, whether that's kindergarten, and hopefully they would have gotten those experiences in some types of early childhood or family setting beforehand. So that's one piece of it, language comprehension. The other piece, and so often our assessments in the early grades, the screeners, deal with the other side of it, which is word recognition. The first one. word recognition where we would call it sight recognition, that you don't have to spend any time figuring out the word, it just becomes part of your uh, vocabulary in terms of your reading. And it requires very little cognitive effort to understand the word. Let's talk a little bit about how reading is developed. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, Jean Shaw and her colleagues at Harvard explained the stages of reading development in an attempt to understand and describe the process of learning to read. Stage zero, which is a critical stage, and now we know more and more about that importance, uh, is, the, is kind of the foundation for all of it. At this stage, the child is developing oral language. They're developing phonemic awareness, that recognition that words are made of sounds. They're developing print awareness, or that literacy knowledge, and letter recognition. This foundation is being built by talking with parents, having stories read to them, and being exposed to language and printed language. Um, so often, we do see that sometimes uh, there is a genetic predisposition or struggle struggling with reading. But we have found, uh, in our experience, and I did consult with several diagnosticians, that before six years of age, uh, it's probably unfortunate to label kids too early. What we want to do is make sure that they have a wide range of experiences to build on. 
stage one, so we would think of this as uh, kind of the school age, um, learning the code, noticing patterns and relationships between sounds and the symbols of language. Alphabetic principles, I mentioned, is making that connection so that sounds of the language are represented by certain symbols or letters. And phonic takes it a step further in understanding syllables and other orthographic patterns. Orthographic is a very fancy word of saying spelling. Think of ortho like orthodonture, meaning straight, and graphic meaning writing. Now, because children are expected to learn to read earlier now than they were in the 70s, we can move those grades back a year. So while traditionally this may have happened in, say, first grade and beyond, now, uh, I think nationally, a lot of these skills are taught in kindergarten. While that may not be critically necessary for our children who come from literacy and language-rich backgrounds, for the children who live in poverty, the thought is the chances of them catching up on vocabulary, uh, it, it's best served by them uh, learning to read early and reading a lot. Stage two is a stage that the struggling reader misses. So this is the practice, practice, practice stage. We say a lot of, it takes a lot of easy reading to make reading easy. While the other kids are practicing and decoding and building that fluency, that automaticity, the struggling reader is trying to memorize as many words as possible and often gets by on listening comprehension. Uh, it is um, a challenge because some of our very uh, bright and there are many uh, twice exceptional students uh, because of their listening comprehension and their ability to be very engaged in class. Uh, they fake it through first and second grade, and it's only when their uh, memory, you can only uh, remember visually so many words, and it's later on in, say, third or fourth grade where we first identify as a problem. In Idaho, uh, thanks to the IRI and thanks to a lot of great educators, it's rare for us to have a child who gets to third grade without being identified as at risk for reading failure. But in my experience as a special ed teacher, I used to see a vast number of students beginning in fourth grade when those stages churn. In stage three, which is where the tables really turn, instead of learning to read, and this would be third grade and above, you're reading to learn. Comprehension becomes the focus of instruction, and this goes on from fourth through eighth grade. Uh, while in the past, in kindergarten, first and second, the teacher was actually providing direct instruction in how to read, by the time they get to third grade, often the teacher hands the student something to read and expects him or her to know how to read it, and then they'll discuss the meaning of the story. For children who struggle, they're still at that uh, word level or their fluency, meaning their rate of reading is very slow, and so it's very hard for them to be able to keep up with the comprehension because they're still focusing on the single word. Stage four and five are essentially high school and college when the volume and the complexity of what we have to read increases. Some readers' compensation strategies get overloaded at this stage, and it is not unusual for them to be recognized as having a reading problem or dyslexia in high school or college. And then finally, the stage that we're in, stage five, is that construction and reconstruction of ideas from reading and written composition. At some point, for most of us, <clears throat> our reading comprehension will far exceed our listening comprehension. For folks with reading disabilities, that is not always the case. Uh, if Unless they learn to read and we provide the intervention early enough with uh, sufficient intensity and they can get their rate of reading to a certain level, their listening comprehension will continue to be better than their reading comprehension uh, on through high school. So those are the stages. And the question is, why doesn't it happen for everybody? Um, so I'm just going to stop right there. Are there any questions? <coughs> Excuse me. What um, what are some of the more um, successful screeners that pick up those kids that maybe have dyslexia or other reading disabilities? Uh, 
Well, there are, there are several of them. Um, one that is used widely is uh, DIBBLES, Dynamic Indicator of Basic English Language Skills, so DIBBLES. Uh, AimsWeb, who created the um, Idaho Reading Indicator, the original one. Um, there's another one called iStation. Basically, when we look for screeners uh, at the kindergarten stage, we would look for letter recognition, uh, the ability to recognize letters. I think there's 40 years or 50 years worth of research that says that uh, that's one of the key cornerstones. Do they master that? Um, and then it would be that phonological awareness, the ability to rhyme. As they get some instruction, then we're going to look for their ability to read words, single words, and then we're going to look for their ability to read fluently. So there are a variety of uh, really good sort of quick screeners, and um, for the most part, that's what we want to do is we want to be able to identify children who might be at risk for reading fail or failure. So great question, and we can talk more about different measures and different and then diagnostic measures beyond the screener. So the first thing we want to do is a screening, sort of like when you walk into the doctor and no matter how many times you've been there, they're going to make you step on the scale, they're going to take your blood pressure and your temperature. That's what screeners are. If any of those things are out of whack, then they're going to do something more diagnostic. Go ahead, Joe Beth, with your other question. Does uh, is Idaho still using Ames Web? The um, Idaho, I for progress monitoring and in special education. Yes, because I I thought the person over the IRI in our school said that um, like things were no longer being reported in Ames Web. I'm not sure on that. Well, Joe Beth, Beth do you want me to answer that? Yes, please. Okay, Joe Beth. Um, no, for the IRI specifically, we do not use Ames Web. Um, we do own um, benchmarks that were created through Ames Web, but we do not upload our scores through Ames Web anymore. Is progress monitoring? Question. Is progress monitoring you, still available? If a district has um, licenses, they can. And I know Special Ed um, and RTI were providing licenses for some districts that applied through um, like a grant or license grant, I guess. Um, they offer some um, subscriptions for AIMSWeb, but for IRI specifically, we don't unless the district has contracted with AIMSWeb directly. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. you, the, you know what we can do, Joe Beth, is we can ask if special, special education through RTI is still offering um, AIMSWeb or some other progress monitoring assessment for the future. Okay, that's good to find out. Any other questions about Charles stages or what we've gone over? Okay. Our challenge, though, is let's see if I can get this to move. That's my challenge now. Um, that was the last one. There we go. Is getting the difference between dyslexia or a reading disability and dystichia. Uh, and I say that you know, kind of as a joke and kind of as the truth. As a practitioner, I will tell you that when I would uh, have students that would be referred to me in fourth grade because they were having trouble, trouble reading, um, they look the same. So whether you have a neurological based issue, which uh, a reading disability, dyslexia is a neurological, um, neurologically based, or you've had a lack of uh, education experience from a functional standpoint, you look the same. And that's where RTI comes in, response to intervention. The difference is in the rate of response. Both students will present the same, but the difference is in the rate of response. When you look at our national statistics, and um, uh, Idaho certainly has higher proficiency than nationally, which is wonderful, and we want to keep it that way and keep improving it. But nationally, only 34% of all fourth graders scored on or above uh, grade level, uh, proficient or advanced, on the National Assessment of Educational Progress, the nation's report card. 66% of students scored at the basic, and they can still function in a classroom, but they're not above on or above grade level or below basic. The research is pretty clear though where you are in third grade is exactly where you are in eighth grade. So if you look at this, we really don't see any difference between where our students are in fourth grade and where our students are in eighth grade. 
I believe that's why uh, the Literacy Committee was formed and the recommendations from the task force, the Governor's Task Force, one of the things that was included was to look at early reading. And the issue is because unless children are reading at a specific honor above grade level, they will struggle with all other subjects. And really where they are ending third grade has a lot to do with where they'll be entering ninth grade. We do, though, see this famous, and it's um, called the fourth grade slump. Uh, but there is a difference, and the whole purpose of the IRI and the reading initiative is to prevent this um, dyslexia versus dystichia, or a reading disability versus unexpected underachievement. Just to be clear, a reading disability is a neurologically based disorder. We like to think of it as an island of weakness in a sea of strengths. So these students have um, average or above average intelligence. Uh, they have strengths in many areas. And often we find that their language is intact. So while they may struggle to sound out words, they have sufficient vocabulary that once you teach them the code, it may take longer. There may require more repetition, may need some additional supports. But once they learn the code, their language, their vocabulary is in, intact. And so if they can learn to read with a sufficient rate, their comprehension won't suffer. The challenge with underachievement, and honestly the highest risk for reading failure is not in fact a reading disability, but poverty, is that lack of early learning experiences, low language that the students simply don't have a sufficient vocabulary. The good news is that if it's a result of underachievement, they respond much more quickly to intervention. I always like to tell this story. I was actually teaching in a middle school, and I was in training for my dyslexia specialist certification, and I had a wonderful uh, coach who came to watch me, and I was so proud because of my eight students, so it was a nice small class, six had gained more than two grades in only six months, and I just, for one day, I thought I was the best teacher in the world, and she sweetly told me, no, they never should have been in special ed. What it was is they had missed school, they hadn't had consistent instruction, and so while I thought I was really fabulous, honestly, uh, the issues could have been remediated way earlier. It was a missed opportunity. It wasn't my fabulous teaching ability. So it's always good to remain humble. At Nye House, we like to think of this, and we use Gowan Tunmer's work, of the simple view of reading. Readers, we. Our skilled readers have both adequate decoding, so that's adequate D, as well as adequate language comprehension. We hope that all our readers have at least those adequate components, and wouldn't it be great if they did? But then we find that some students may have adequate language comprehension, but they have poor decoding. That would be considered the typical profile for dyslexia. But then we have a group of students that may actually have adequate decoding. Their issue is poor language comprehension. They lack vocabulary. We see that very commonly among students living in poverty who may not have come from a language or literacy rich environment. But it is also sometimes, and some of you may have encountered this in your classroom, sort of word callers. They can read the word, but they don't have a concept or a comprehension of what that word means. And then we have the last category, which would be a double deficit. So those are students that have poor decoding skills as well as poor language comprehension. Our task, or the point of assessment, is to find out why a reader is having difficulty. We want to find each reader's strengths and capitalize on those strengths and find each reader's weaknesses and remediate those weaknesses as quickly as possible. Questions or comments about this, this simple view of reading? I think this will be helpful as we start talking about the function of assessment and why we need and why we need specific assessments for specific skills. Very best, Leanne had a comment. Leanne, are you, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, um, go ahead. I know Utah did um, some studies at Granite School District, and they compared kids. Um, they, what they found is their kids that were, they had a higher percentage of these low-income kids that were in their special education program that actually didn't need to be there if they had early childhood education. They were able this last year to do a social impact bond because they could demonstrate 
significant enough savings to the district to be able to have um, Goldman Sachs invest the money for the pre-K program. And then the savings that the school district had uh, paid back the investors, and then it, it for the for the first period of time, the second period it was 50-50 between the district and the investors, and then in the end the district had to pay all of the costs of the preschool, but they kept all of the um, savings from not having all these kids in uh, special education that actually could be in a mainstream classroom if they just had early childhood education. Wow, that's, um, that's very impressive. I know one of the things that when we look at the Idaho data, initially when we first, shortly after the reading initiative was passed in 99, it went into effect in 2000, we saw some huge increases in our number, our percentage of students who were in special education reading on grade level, and then we saw a plateau and level off. But what we think happened is something similar to what you were saying, Leanne, was we probably had students in special education who, when they received proper instruction, probably did not have, they didn't have the need for it. I do want to also be clear that the research is pretty clear that we can teach about 95% of all children to read. Um, and so with the right intervention, whether or not they do have a specific learning disability, they can read on or above grade level. Um, and the research is also pretty clear that the earlier you intervene, so that's that early childhood piece, the greater the likelihood is of success. So it's nice to have some funds to, to play with, though. That's impressive. So the Granite School District, huh? I'm going to have to look that up. I can send out um, the white paper and some of the information on it to the group if you'd like. Yeah, I think that would be interesting. That would be very interesting. I'll send it to Stephanie and let her send it on. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. and we can put that on our Google site. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about dyslexia and related reading disabilities. So, first of all, I wanted to give you this, and you will all have access to uh, this uh, PowerPoint feel free to use it. That's one of the nice things about being um, a nonprofit. By the way, we do a lot of work with uh, uh, the medical center here, um, pediatricians, um, all kinds of uh, family support groups just to make sure that people have information about uh, best practices in terms of working with uh, children and adults with reading disabilities. But some of the best research that we have found is at the National Institutes of Child Health and Human Development, the NICHD. They were the sponsors of the National Reading Panel. The National Institute of Neurological Disorders, the International Dyslexia Association, um, and that truly is international. There are thousands of members all over the country. The Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity, um, it's Dr. Sally and Bennett Shaywitz, and still uh, one of the best books I've ever written about reading disabilities is Overcoming Dyslexia by Sally Shaywitz, and then the Center on Response to Intervention. And interestingly, our very own Dr. Evelyn Johnson has several articles uh, posted on the Center for Response to Intervention. So those are all good places if you have any questions, and please always feel free to uh, ask me. I probably don't know the answer, but luckily I have a lot of wonderful people around me who can find it. So one of the big things that was discovered <clears throat> in the 90s was that um, reading relies on the same brain circuitry as language. Before that, it was thought to be mostly a visual problem. There is expressive and receptive language. Receptive language is your ability to take things in that are said to you or read to you, understand, and understand them, and act on them appropriately. That takes place in Wernicke's area. We're going to do a little brain work. And then expressive language is the ability to find, to retrieve that word and the meaning you want in long-term memory and speak in understandable ways. That's called Broca's area. Sometimes you hear about Broca's aphasia after someone has had a stroke. Okay, so here's the brain. All right, so the eye uh, sees, sees the printed word. Then the eye sends the image to the occipital cortex, which converts the impulse to an image. There's your occipital cortex. 
the angular gyrus, this is the area where that sound symbol association takes place, actually converts the image to a sound pattern. Wernicke's area then figures out the meaning of those sounds, which when you think about it is a very abstract concept. Now you can link the letters one sees on a page to sounds and combine the sounds to form words. And then if you wish to read the word aloud, it has to then travel to Broca's area in order to speak. So Broca's area and Wernicke's area are in the cerebral cortex. So let's go over that again. Suppose you see the you see the m, mm, you see the m. You perceive the printed word. Impulses are carried to the occipital cortex where they're changed from sounds into symbols. That is, if the child knows the symbol, the activity then moves to the angular gyrus where the visual recognition or symbolic language translates into symbols or sounds of language. Wernicke's area gives meaning, and Broca's area allows us to speak and read aloud. So when you think about that and you think about the challenge of a child who's struggling, look at all of the neurological activity that happens for you to read the word cat. So often when, um, and I just have such an affinity for those kiddos who struggle, but so often when our children are struggling to read and the teacher is asking them to read aloud, think of all of the um, neurological activity that has to go on to read one word. Spelling is even more challenging because you're asking children to hear the word, break it into phonemes, they do that in the occipital cortex, then process it, spell it in sequential order, and then say that out loud. So it's actually very, very complicated. I do just want to mention that the PowerPoint will be on the Google Doc site, and so you're welcome to see it. It's also available and a lot more information for those of you who might want it or need it, or if you need to send parents or other staff members in your district, you're welcome to come to the Nye House Education Center site. Uh, we have lots of information there, and it's all available as well as um, webinars and, and information. But for our purposes, this presentation will be in the Google Doc site. So when you look about it, they're really, and the wonderful thing about what happened with the advancement in neuroscience was also this idea of imaging. Um, we have always known that there were folks who struggled with reading who had average or above average intellect, uh, but the way we were able to see the neurological processes was only through an autopsy. Uh, that's a little challenging, but with the advancement of PET scans and brain imaging, we can actually look at the brain of a skilled reader versus a dyslexic brain. So when you see, when you're reading and it's a typical um, a neurological pattern, you see all of those uh, different areas light up. For a person with a reading disability, it's a very um, analytical process. Usually only Broca's area is um, activated in the process of reading. Over time, though, the Shaywitz's research at Yale has demonstrated that, in fact, we can form new neurological processes and new neurological connections. The challenge is one of speed, that for the, um, for the skilled reader, you do it uh, in such a quick fashion that it seems as if it's instant word recognition, whereas for someone with a reading disability, even after remediation, time may be an issue or will be an issue, I should say. So here's the big question, and I get this all the time. Do dyslexic students make more reversal errors than other students? Do you have any brave volunteers who want to answer that one? I don't see any hands raised. The answer is no. The term dyslexia dates back into the early 1900s. Uh, Samuel T. Orton um, was considered the father of dyslexia. Dyslexia is actually Greek for twisted symbols, but it wasn't until the 1990s that we realized that dyslexia had nothing to do with actually making reversals. Students with dyslexia will often make more reversals than their uh, skilled reader peers, but the issue is a sound-based issue. The issue is they don't have a strong enough association with the sound, and when you think of the difference between, say, a B and a D visually, they look very similar, um, and the sound is also very similar, the B versus the D. And so, um, but dyslexic students are no more likely to make reversal errors than other students. 
I get a lot of calls from nervous moms and grandmothers who worry about children making reversals. Um, dyslexics are no more likely to make reversals than students who are skilled readers. Uh, what is more of a concern would be an inability to uh, rhyme, to remember nursery rhymes, to be able to uh, retrieve words quickly, and to um, learn their letters. Um, but making reversals is just a developmental milestone, but they're no more likely. People with reading disabilities often do struggle with spelling, um, but again, that relates to that sound symbol correspondence rather than reversals. So how is a student with reading disabilities different from a skilled reader? Well, the student with a reading disability does not pick up the patterns of a language. There are two areas. One is the phonological, that sound level, and the other is the orthographic level, or that spelling level. Current research supports a prevalent view that dyslexia involves language problems. Some, but not all, show a significant relationship between early language processing and or a production problems that are later reading problems. Interestingly, a lot of students who have itch issues with speech early on, articulation disorders, are at a higher risk for having reading disabilities. On a phonological level, uh, students with reading disabilities will have a difficult time often with rhyming. Um, I have one friend, she's an adult now and a mom herself, and uh, it was Dr. Seuss's birthday and we were having a big party here at Nye House. We love Dr. Seuss and she said she hates him. She still doesn't get it why it's funny. It makes no sense to her. They might also have a difficult time identifying the number of words in a sentence that's referred to as word boundaries. If you've ever listened to someone speak another language and they're talking, you really can't tell where one word ends and, one, and the next word begins. It all sounds the same. Uh, students with reading disabilities often need to be taught those very specific boundaries around words. They may also struggle identifying syllables in a word and identifying individual sounds in a word. So, um, for example, Let's do a couple examples. So for hearing the words in the sentence, I'm going to say a sentence. I want you to count the number of words. The big red truck races down the street. I'll say it again. The big red truck races down the street. How many, how many words are in that sentence? You can type in the answer. Only Stephanie can see. Bobby says eight. Natalie says eight. Diane Yay. says eight. OK, good. You got it. For a student with a reading disability, they'd give you a five, they'd give you a four, or they'd hear the big red or the big red truck and they give up. But the ability to count words in a sentence, for those of you that are around little people, is a critical skill. It's also a great thing to do when you're waiting for an older brother or sister. Hearing words in a syllable, uh, it's, it's hearing syllables in a word, uh, if you go into Idaho kindergartens, pre-K or first grade, you'll see a lot of clapping going on, a lot of hands under chins. So for example, if I said the word fantastic, how many syllables? Natalie says three, Diane says three, Bobby yes, says three. Yes, well you guys are all Claire very skilled. Three. Yes, it's three syllables, but that ability to recognize words and the syllables in words is a, is, a, is a real challenge for students with reading disabilities. And then oftentimes the biggest challenge is hearing individual sounds in the words. For example, in the word mop, we hear mop, so three phonemes. But when you think about how important, important that is, uh, over and over again, we've seen children, and so that would be something to look for on an assessment, but the ability to segment words into phonemes and then blend the individual sounds of the language is a critically important skill for subsequent reading achievement. One phoneme is the difference between, say, sit and slit. Um, when we think about it, and this is Keith Stanovich did this, I think now it's going on 20 years ago, but it's called the Matthew effect. And, uh, we can't emphasize enough the critical importance of those early uh, reading experiences, language experience, and phonemic awareness is sort of the big money winner. And this kind of came out of the research that was done in the in the 90s. But phonemic children who have um, that structure, the ability to recognize sounds, to segment and unblend, 
will learn to read easily. They'll enjoy reading, which means they'll gain fluency. They'll practice, practice, practice. They'll read more. They'll develop their vocabulary. They'll develop world knowledge. They'll gain that syntactical understanding of language. They'll understand text structure, comprehension, and they'll learn to they'll learn through reading and all of that uh, adds to self-esteem. So the Matthew effect is taken from the Bible in the sense of the rich get richer. The challenge is also though that the poor get poorer. So children who do not have that phonemic awareness, they don't have that facility with sound symbol, they don't learn to read easily, they don't gain that critical time of fluency that happens in first and second grade, they don't enjoy reading and they don't read. So the research is pretty clear about um, all of that and how that, that leads to more challenges moving forward in school. Let me give you an example of the importance of <clears throat> sound symbol correspondence. So do we have anybody, can you unmute yourself for a second? Let me hear you. One, it, what's the first word? Boom. Good. And what's the second word? Make. Make. What's the rule that you just applied to be able to read the words boom and make? Vowel consonant A pattern. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So while those are nonsense words, and you can put yourself back on mute for a second. If Taken, you have taken what you know about language structure, you recognize that vowel consonant E, which means the E is silent and the vowel is long, and you have read two nonsense words, boom and mate. You apply that same skill since you've learned that pattern to words that are unfamiliar. Now what about those, those second group of words, G-T-S-I and Y-N-R-H? Good readers are going to have difficulty with that second group because it's not a pattern. Students with reading disabilities, all four words are going to look the same. And that's why on a lot of the early assessments you see nonsense words. It's to find out if the students are faking it. Do they actually know those phonetic structures and can apply them, or have they just simply memorized the words? Let me give you an example of how that impacts students later in life. Okay, I want some, try to read this word to yourself. What's the word? How about if somebody unmutes themselves and reads it aloud to us? Well, the meaning of this word is an inactive substance secreted by the pancreas. I know I use it daily, but the word is trypsinogen. You can read this longer word because you have a sense of how to divide the word. You understand T-R-Y-P, which is unusual, but, not, um, but a regular pattern would be pronounced trip. You see the syllable sin, O, jin. And so you, without having to think about it, are applying what you know about the patterns of language and syllable division. This is not a natural skill, and it's not a skill that will come easily to a child who's struggling with a reading disability. When you struggle with decoding, it impacts your reading comprehension. So before I go any further, are there any questions about the nature of reading disabilities? Okay. From a state perspective, a district perspective, a building perspective, or a classroom perspective, the traditional profile of a child with a reading disability or dyslexia is one who has intact language, 
average or above average intelligence, but, settle, but struggles with that phonemic awareness, phonological awareness, and word recognition. Once they are given those tools and taught the structure of the language, their vocabulary, their world knowledge, and their cognitive abilities will compensate. To be clear, though, when you see sometimes on special educations where it's extended time, that is not an unfair accommodation. People with reading disabilities will always struggle with rate of reading. Different researchers will argue it from a functional standpoint. The one that I usually follow is unless you read at least 100 words per minute as a rate, chances are your comprehension will, you will struggle with comprehension. One of the reasons why fluency has been such an emphasis in terms of reading is it used to be considered a forgotten skill. For those of us who learned to read early, read a lot, we just developed a certain amount of automaticity, the ability to do it quickly, which led to fluency. And so we were able to read quickly, and then we could um, use our cognitive or our metacognitive abilities to focus on the meaning of what we were reading. For folks who have reading disabilities, if they're still struggling at the single word level, um, the fluency becomes an issue. And if you're struggling at the word level or you're struggling to get a certain rate, you only have so much of what the neuroscientists would call executive function to be able to focus on the meaning. That would be the profile of the typical child who has a reading disability. But there are more and more that we identify that may also have, or separately, they may be able to decode, but what they have is an issue with language. So what they lack is either vocabulary, and that could be environmental, or as, or as Leanne was saying, a lack of early childhood experiences, a lack of exposure to uh, literacy, to vocabulary. So it could be environmental, or it could be that the child actually does have an issue with either receptive or expressive language, and so it's a language-based disability. Either way, they may look the same on a standardized test. So you could give them the Stanford 10, the ITBS, any of those tests, or for that matter, the ISET, and they bo may both score below grade level. The question is one to understand why are they scoring below grade level? Is it a language comprehension issue, or is it a word recognition or decoding issue? Questions, comments from some of our practitioners. Which do you see more in your classrooms? I see more um, decoding. Most of the kids in our school um, well, there's very there's very few kids from different ethnic groups. There are kids that come from poor homes where they haven't been given those language receptors, but we, we can usually get the vocabulary up easier than the decoding for those that are struggling. So you, for you, you see more of the students who are actually struggling with the decoding than the language? Yes. Okay. Anybody else? In areas of more high poverty, or especially if you have a large percentage of English language learners, you may uh, see it, it may be different. So the challenge from an assessment and a state perspective is not so much the summative assessment, the end of the year will tell us, are they reading on or above grade level? But from a practitioner standpoint, we need to know why are they reading below grade level. Is it language or is it decoding? And that way the teachers can then focus the uh, remediation and the intervention on the, on the area of need. As children get older, it becomes even more important to be very prescriptive in the teaching and to only fill in those gaps. Okay. So research. Interestingly, that the National Reading Panel's results, it was commissioned by the Congress in 1997, so it was under the Clinton administration, but then it was reported in 2000. Uh, and it became the basis of a lot of work. Uh, Idaho was sort of, was definitely ahead of the curve in the sense that the, the reading initiative was first um, uh, voted on and approved in 1999. 
at about the same time or shortly thereafter was the release of the National Reading Panel Report, which became the basis of a lot of the work that was done in terms of the professional development for teachers as well as the selection of the assessment. So what they did was identify, it was a meta-analysis <clears throat> uh, based on 15 to 20,000 different research studies and their goal was to boil down the research to discover how kids, how kids learn to read so that information could be used to guide instruction and prevent reading failure. Whoops, that's interesting. So basically it was the big five, phonemic awareness, decoding, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. And these were considered the big five pillars of effective reading instruction from the National Reading Panel report. A member of the National Reading Panel report, so again, uh, kudos to Stephanie, is Dr. David Francis. Uh, so I don't know if you knew that, uh, Stephanie, but he's the person that you asked to review the IRI, so I want to give you a big shout out about how wonderful that was. He was actually the psychometrician for the group and looked at the technical adequacy of the, of the, of the different studies. But from all of the studies everywhere, they were able to uh, narrow it down to these five areas of instruction. They also, though, looked at uh, the type of instruction. And they came up with these list of recommendations that beginning teaching in kindergarten, phonemic awareness directly uh, and in kindergarten. It could also be, well, that's interesting, um, you can do it certainly earlier, but kindergarten is the place to start it if students haven't had it before. The other thing that was important that they said to teach each letter phoneme relationship explicitly, which would be decoding. Um, and that's important because while some of our letters map to sound, sometimes you run into things like TCH or IGH. And for students who struggle with reading, there's no way they're going to get ch from TCH. They also suggested that um, uh, teach frequently, highly, highly regular letter sound relationships systematically. So rather than doing it in isolation, that there should be an explicit and systematic uh, course of instruction. Idaho has done that for years. The other thing they said is to show students exactly how to sound out words. Um, sometimes our children who struggle with reading uh, may guess. Uh, it doesn't get you very far. Your chances of, correcting the, of guessing the right word when you're not a skilled reader are only one in eight. Uh, give children connected or decodable text to practice that letter phoneme relationships. Uh, one of the things that we want to see during reading instruction is actually reading. And then using interesting stories to develop language and comprehension. I will say that in addition to the top five pillars regarding literacy, there are many who think that um, the National Reading Panel uh, was too narrow in their search and should have included direct instruction in writing as well. So the ability to read and comprehend depends upon rapid and automatic recognition and decoding of single words. Slow and inaccurate decoding are the best predictors of difficulties in reading comprehension. So just as you were saying that that's the area that the children are struggling with or the ones you identify with, uh, identified as having a challenge, it is that slow and inaccurate decoding. And that will more likely impact reading comprehension. So if you were to just, there, how about if I just don't show that message again. So if you just say you have a student or fourth or fifth grade and you only focus on reading comprehension strategies, that's not going to get them very far when the issue is still at the decoding level. So when we think about reading comprehension, that's an outcome, but it is impacted by our decoding skills, our ability to instantly um, decode, sound out the words, put the words together. Fluency, which is the rate and accuracy, so it's not good enough to be fast. You have to be fast and accurate, accurate and do it for meeting. Uh, language and listening comprehension, uh, we can't emphasize enough to practitioners and to families that um, children learn so much from being read to. That's why that 20 minutes a night of having read to your children, over and over again, we see children who are read to early and often outperform their peers who are not. World knowledge builds that oral language, that critical piece uh, that teaches verbal reasoning and vocabulary. Strategic thinking. Uh, I was unaware of this because uh, if you are a skilled reader, 
you probably do make mental pictures while you're reading. Uh, there is a certain group of students or a group of people who, who need to be taught to visualize because they don't necessarily make those pictures in their mind. And then carrying on that inner dialogue. That inner dialogue is the one that makes you go back and reread if you didn't understand something. It makes you slow down when you come to a word you don't know and be able to try to figure it out from context clues. But good readers are constantly having an inner dialogue with themselves. It also requires that ability to make inference. So often we see our students in upper grades that they may be able to answer a question about a passage they've read if the information is on the page. What they can't do is draw a conclusion or infer meaning from what's on the page. That's why a lot of the assessments now uh, ask things about drawing inference or author's point of view. And finally, that ability to attend. Very frequently, or I shouldn't say very frequently, but about 50% of the children with attention deficit disorder will also have a reading disability. The two conditions are what's called um, comorbid. They exist uh, within the same individual, but they're not related. It's sort of like if you had lung cancer and a broken leg. Yes, you have both, but they're not necessarily attached. So attention deficit disorder does not necessarily cause a reading disability, nor does a reading disability cause attention deficit, but oftentimes we see them together in the same uh, student or the same individual. I will say this, if you have a hard time um, learning to read, it's going to be hard to be paying attention. It's hard to stay engaged when we're asking you to do something that's very challenging. When we're talking about it, and Idaho has moved from this whole three tiers, but I just wanted to make sure we were all on the same page. Idaho now has a multi-tiered system of support, but traditionally we've talked about tier one, that's that regular classroom teacher, and by the way, the regular classroom teacher can, um, research has shown, can, can reach almost uh, like 88% of all children in terms of teaching them to read highly effective teacher 95, but that would be that core reading program, the instruction you receive in the regular classroom. Even with tier one, though, you need some kind of progress monitoring to make sure that children are staying on track and making growth. Tier two, that would be the regular classroom plus being pulled out maybe in small groups for a short time or even within the classroom that the teacher works with groups of students to kind of pre-teach or reteach skills. And then remedial programs would be for those students who need more intensive reading remediation. Some children simply need um, more repetition. They need it uh, broken down more explicitly. They need more sy systematic instruction and that they don't necessarily put all the pieces and parts together. And that would be a remedial program or tier three. So some of these things that I've gone over are covered in the IDEA, which is Public Law 94-142, or the um, Special Education Law, that was revised in 1995, and then again in 2004. Um, in 2004, it does specifically mention the term uh, specific learning disabilities. Uh, there are 13 areas of qualification. Dyslexia is mentioned in one of those 13 areas. Uh, it is in the DSM-4 and it is a neurological, um, but for our purposes, at least in Idaho, we usually use the term a specific learning disability related to reading or reading disability. But there is legislation, there's federal legislation that uh, protects these students and requires services. There are many students who struggle with reading who operate just fine in the regular classroom with very little support. Um, they may just need extended time, they may be benefit from a note taker, but if we intervene early, they will read on grade level and they will always read on or above grade level. But they are, um, they are pre protected by federal legislation. The legislation that I mentioned earlier that uh, Congressman Cassidy and his uh, cohort, uh, his Democrat, he's a Republican from Baton Rouge, um, there he has a Democratic colleague who's doing it, is so that um, protect students as they move on from high school to college. Currently now, for folks to continue to get accommodations or extensions, they have to be evaluated every three years. And their point is, once you're diabetic, you're always diabetic. You don't have to prove it to everybody every three years. And oftentimes, once they're out of the K-12 system, that's something that they have to pay for that may or may not be covered by their health insurance. So they feel that the folks with dyslexia or reading disabilities should be protected over their 
uh, lifetime, just as you would there, if there was something else going on. So that's a lot of information. Questions? Did we get disconnected? What happened? Uh, Mary Beth, I have a question. This is Leanne. Yes. Um, you said 88% 80, uh, could be dealt with in a classroom and 95% if it was a highly effective teacher. For Tier 2 and Tier 3, what are the percentages then of kids that typically fall in that? So we would say in a, in a perfect, uh, and there are many schools, we're very fortunate in Idaho that we have many schools that they would say 85% of the students uh, are tier one, meaning they only receive, they're only in the general ed classroom. And then an additional 10% uh, might be receiving intervention from the classroom teacher or maybe a Title I teacher or somebody else in addition to the regular instruction. And then 5% um, might benefit from an alternative program or special education services. Um, it really depends, and that's going to be, I think, that's why I'm leaving that till the October and November and kind of get there, because um, there are so many different models within Idaho, and there are many different effective ways to deal with it. But in a perfect world, we would hope to see like 85, 80 to 85% of the students being on or above grade level just from that tier one, that good classroom instruction. And then an additional, say, 10% who receive both tier two, which would be some additional support, and then less than 5% of the students who would benefit from remediation. Yeah, I it's easier to think about, you know, because I think we have to think about what is the cost factor as we're yeah. deciding this. And I know you said that, that Idaho doesn't use just that three-tiered program, but I think it's really important if we have some statistics for us to know what those are so that we can think about, you know, we can make recommendations to the legislature on how this should be done, but if it's completely out of the realm of what's available financially, um, it's going to be a lot of time wasted. Yeah, I have, I have to, so I, I, yes, I'm processing that, which is, it's always true. I do think, though, that the, the challenge is, one, it's just um, how much do you want to, how much do you want in legislation versus how much should be, uh, and Idaho is a local control state, it's, that's worked well, um, but it's always a question of how much should be in legislation so that it's not, uh, not tying the hands of the folks that are making the decisions closest to the child but it provides enough support so that it offers options. I think it was Carrie who said, wouldn't it be great if it was like real estate and we went to different schools to see models? I do think that that's something because uh, I believe everybody wants to do what's best for the children, but sometimes you don't know what you don't know, and being able to visit other places where they have specific systems in place, whether that's a three-tier system or a multi-tiered system of support, can often be just when a, a group of teachers, administrators, family uh, you know, community members need to see how it could look. Um, a lot of a lot of the a lot of this is not expensive and doesn't require any additional funds. Mm. Um, so I, you know, I just have to say that that it's really not it's not like adding to. I do think that um, at the time when the legislation was first passed. We had a high percentage of children who were reading below grade level that has gone down. We want to keep it low. Uh, we, the original intention was to over-identify children who might be at risk of reading failure, recognizing that we'd rather have a false positive, meaning that they could be at risk, than a false negative and miss somebody. Uh, so I think that your earlier expression of the earlier you intervene, we could be wrong. It's not going to hurt for a kid to get a little extra attention and say, no, they were fine. They just weren't paying attention. Do you know, I mean, exactly where right. the test didn't mean anything or they didn't like the lady who gave them the assessment or whatever, you know, the hamster died, they forgot their lunch, whatever the, you know, whatever the most recent issue was. We'd rather have that than miss kids because it does get really expensive, uh, third grade and above, and it's mostly expensive when you think of the societal impact. I believe it's something like 85% of those folks that are incarcerated do not have a high school diploma. Right. So you feel like, as far as the financing end, that the, there's adequate financing now for every district to do 
some form of this tiered intervention. You know, whatever, I, on a local level, whatever they want to choose. Um, I never like to say in absolutes because it always <laughs> depends. You know, I mean, it's like it always depends. I mean, it depends because a lot of it is, and, and I know that um, there there was research in the department. I think still uses it about what are the demographics of the districts. So one of the things we did was uh, um, uh, look at high needs and low resources. So for example, Boise, Boise School District would be a good example, which is they do have high needs. Boise is, uh, has seen a, an increase in the number of children living in poverty. It's also a refugee center, so they have high needs. And I'm not saying they have high resources or the, all of the funds that they want, but when you look at what's available from a tax base, they also have high resources. Mm -hmm. So they have high needs, but also high resources from a tax base. When you would compare that with, say, um, someplace in Cacha County, maybe Paul or something like that, uh, and they have a large percentage of students who are, say, from migrant farm worker families, they also have high needs. Their tax base is lower, so they have low resources. Mm -hmm. So some districts may need more funds based on their demographics and the available tax base. So that's probably more information than you wanted. No, it's it really, actually not. It's perfect. <laughs> um, and then we have some that have uh, low needs and high resources. Um, I mean, I, I love going to Sun Valley, but we don't see a lot of need there. Now, you don't go too far away. You're in Shoshone. You see a lot of need and a lower tax base, right? So we kind of need to look at what are the specific situations within that district in terms of the demographics of the students and the available tax base to meet those needs. Mm -hmm. Thank so you. So equal isn't, what is it, fair isn't always equal? Is that what you're <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mary Beth, Claire um, has a question. Sure. Hi, Claire. Hi, Steve had a question. Hi, okay. hi. Yeah, this is Steve, and hi, Mary Beth. And just to add to what you were saying about the, the financial side of things, um, what Mary Beth had said earlier was that a lot of the things she's talking about don't necessarily take finances to change the instructional practices. So, for example, you know, you don't necessarily need to buy new materials, but at the same time, your, the nuance of your question also had the word adequate. So, so do districts currently have adequate resources to do all these things and provide all these tiers of instruction? And that's a, that's a bit bigger question because that gets into a lot of the, the systems that drive time and resources and materials and so forth. So, so, so like Mary Beth said, it's, it's nuanced. So I'd say, you know, I, I think she answered it well, but it gets beyond if that helps in any way. Oh. Yeah, I know, um, but I do think I, I do think it's very doable. But of course, yeah, as an educator, how could I say that we have all the resources we need? <laughs> that hasn't happened to me yet. But I do think that within the confines of our budget, whatever it is, we can improve the efficacy of the system uh, by some thoughtful consideration about identifying students early and providing a sufficient intervention to, what we don't want to do is have them get to fourth grade or beyond, certainly not to middle school and still be struggling with reading. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? Okay. Well, if you think of anything as a follow-up, please feel free to let me know. I thought, that, and I'm so I'm so grateful that you participated in this because what I really want to do uh, when we come together on Wednesday, and it's really hard because if you talk about the assessment, you almost have to talk about what's going to be the remediation. If you talk about the professional development and you talk about all of this, all of this requires resources, both human capital, financial, all of those things. Um, but I did think that before we talked about assessment this coming Wednesday, it would be important for us to make clear a few things. One is that we need to identify which children truly may have a reading disability versus those students who might be at risk due to other environmental factors. And then just identifying that a child is reading below grade level 
is necessary but not sufficient. Why are they reading below grade level? Is it because of a deficit in decoding? Is it because of a language issue? Or is it both? Because with that information uh, will allow the teacher to de design or the school to design an intervention program that's much more likely to be successful. So often in the past that some of our remedial things haven't worked because we treated everybody the same. Um, I mean, you could go in, go to the doctor, I always like to use the medical model, go to the doctor because you have a headache. Well, you could just have a headache and um, two Advil and you're going to feel better. You could have a brain tumor. The treatment is very different. So while they might present the same, we need to be a little bit more prescriptive in terms of the assessments we use so that we can treat whatever the underlying issue is. So I look forward to seeing everybody uh, a week from tomorrow. Um, I'll be sending out the agenda. I will also be sending out, um, and there's, please, if you haven't already, to go on the Google site. We will put the PowerPoint there as soon as we're done. So uh, Claire will post that. Thank you so much. I will also be sending you uh, a summary document that was done by Dr. Christy Santi and Dr. David Francis on the current IRI because we will really, and Steve will be walking us through what a comprehensive assessment system looks like. So we're going to be doing a lot kind of on the assessment piece this time. But we also have, uh, we'll be kind of anchoring our practice, going back over our expected outcomes. And I think that the agenda we've come up kind of reflects, in, in terms of the assessment pieces, the input of the group. But if you have any concerns or thoughts, please send them me, uh, and we'll try to make sure that everything's focused. Uh, I just had the opportunity of visiting my daughter, Rachel, who's a newly minted college graduate in, um, in D.C., uh, working hard, and I thought, oh, that sounds like our, what our hopeful is our group, which is E. Plurius, e Plurius Unum. Now I can't even talk. I've been talking for an hour, which is out of many one. I really have a goal that we have one solid uh, recommendation for the state board, and then the next step will be getting it all implemented. So. Any last thoughts, questions, concerns? OK, thanks very much, everybody. Um, if I don't speak to you beforehand, I will see you next Wednesday, the 13th, at the Capitol. Thank you.